Good morning, Livingstones Church. And again, I thank you for asking me to speak to you today. It's always a privilege and a pleasure. So today we're starting a three-week mini-series called Tough Questions for Christians. It's important to talk about the difficult questions, even if it makes us feel uncomfortable, or even if it makes us angry. But this series is meant to be an encouragement to help us answer the tough questions we ask ourselves in relation to God, the Bible and Christianity, or to be equipped to deal with the tough questions we are asked by others in relation to God, the Bible and Christianity. It's important to talk about these questions in church or in church groups as we are doing now, because if we can't listen, learn and love inside our safe place, then we will never do it out in the world. Firstly, as we study, we must put ourselves under the authority of the Bible, the Holy Word of God. We take our lead from 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word of God confronts us, challenges us and corrects us, Often we don't like to be corrected, but the role of scriptures is to correct us when we are in error. It's not my job to correct you or even give you all of the answers because I don't have them. But I am here to stand with you under the authority of the Bible, the Holy Word of God, and try to point towards his truth, not my truth or your truth, but his truth alone. There is the expression that the truth hurts but as we read in John 8.32, the truth will also set you free. In this series, I would ask you to consider whether what we are hearing and learning is from God before any upset is caused or any offence is taken. Let us approach the tough questions we are discussing in this series as curious and humble learners, ready to have our perspective changed and shaped by the word of God. So before we can start applying the Bible to the tough questions, we need to decide what we think about the Bible. So we are beginning the series with the question, how can you take the Bible literally? This is a question we may have asked of ourselves and will probably be a question we have been asked by others, sometimes in a disparaging way. Because on the surface of it all, there's a lot of fantastical stuff in there and at times it contradicts itself. The answer to this first question, how can you take the Bible literally, is you can't. Well, that's the short and sweet version. You can't take the Bible literally, at least not all of it, because not all of it is intended to be taken literally. The Bible isn't just one book, it's a collection of books containing poetry, history and personal letters codes of law, parables, songs, philosophy, which simply means love of wisdom, which we see in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. But it's all communication from God. This rich diversity of literature is all communication from our creator to his creation, which, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, is inspired by God himself. We read that the breath of God breathes into scriptures, It is God speaking to us through them. It doesn't mean that God dictated the Bible and others wrote it down as copyists. That isn't what Christians believe. We believe that God, through his Holy Spirit, collaborated with human authors, kings, scholars, poets, doctors, historians and and statesmen who made all of this rich variety of different types of literature. So the Bible is uniquely... 100% the work of human beings and 100% the work of God. How can that be? 
Well, if you were asked who built St Paul's Cathedral in London, you would correctly answer Sir Christopher Wren. But Christopher Wren didn't himself mix the mortar and stack the bricks or sculpt the statues or, fix the sta or fit the stained glass windows. He was the architect who oversaw his plan. It was many others who did the actual work. They followed his plan and used their individual expertise, abilities and skills as bricklayers, carpenters, painters and sculptors to bring the plan into fruition. Behind everything they were doing, there was one mind, a plan and an architect. This is true of the Bible. Behind all of the different writers, there was one architect, one inspiration, God himself working through human beings. Because God is so much wiser and vastly more intelligent than humans, he needed humans to make communication with us easier. God is not always literal because human beings are not always literal. If I told you today that I had a broken heart, it would not mean that I wanted one of you to rush over to give me CPR, would it? My heart is not physically malfunctioning, it is just one way to describe the emotion of hurting and sadness. Similarly, if I were to say that Matt has thrashed me at Scrabble, it wouldn't mean that he had violently and repeatedly struck me whilst playing a board game, would it? It's the same in the Bible. If we look at the scene described in John 2, 14 to 25, when Jesus cleared the temple courts from traders and money exchanges, the Jews questioned him about his authority to do so. So let's read. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this all? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jewish leaders take him literally. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days. Then the narrator explains, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. We see other examples of statements made by Jesus not to be taken literally. Keeping in John, but moving on to chapter 3, we see the late night conversations between Jesus and Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus interprets this as a literal statement and asks the question, How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asks. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. He has a point. This would be a very strange and impossible thing to do. But Jesus wasn't speaking literally. He wasn't talking about a physical rebirth, but a spiritual one. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again of water and the spirit. Jesus wasn't being literal here in the many other scriptures too. The Old Testament is full of non-literal verses. A passage from Isaiah 55 describes the word of God in terms of food and drink. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, eat and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come listen to me that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. 
This isn't suggesting that we put ketchup and mayonnaise on our Bibles and start chewing. It's describing how the Word of God sustains us spiritually, not physically. The Psalms are full of metaphors, similes, similes and imagery. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree, according to Psalm 92. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, The Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. But clearly, this doesn't literally mean that righteous people turn into trees and begin producing fruit. Neither does it mean that God is a lump of stone that we keep in our geode collection. Some of you may be thinking that all of this is fairly obvious, but in a 2014 survey of pastors in the United States, 28% affirmed this statement. The Bible is the actual word of God and is to be taken literally word for word. That would make Matthew 5, 29 to 30, very interesting. Presumably, these pastors are recognisable by their missing body parts. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Clearly, Jesus is not telling people to maim themselves. We are made in God's image after all. Jesus' body part metaphors refers to the various aspects of our lives that might cause us to sin. Perhaps it's a possession or an activity. Perhaps it's a relationship or an occupation. Terminating any of those things is losing a part of our lives. It is painful. But if the disciples don't rid themselves of any aspect of their lives which makes them stumble, then they can end up losing all that they value. Humans use metaphors, similes, hyperbole and vivid imagery to convey our thoughts and feelings. God communicates with humans through the Bible. God so longed to communicate with humans, he became human in the person of Jesus, so he could speak to us human to human. However, it is crucial to remember and not be confused that even if we can't always take the Bible literally, it doesn't mean that it isn't true. In fact, some of the most truthful expressions in life can't be taken literally. For example, if I describe Matt as being the light of my life, which he is, I'm not saying that he is a flash torch. If I describe my great niece as a ray of sunshine, which she most definitely is, it does not mean that she is a stream of electromagnetic radiation. I'm using metaphors to describe deep emotional feelings. Rebe Rebecca McLaughlin, author of Confronting Christianity says, we must be careful to distinguish between true and literal, and we must be attentive to the genre of any biblical text in order to discern its meaning. The Bible contains a variety of literary genres. So the first step in determining whether we should take the Bible literally or not is to determine what is the type of literature that you are reading at that moment? Just because we have faith doesn't mean that we leave our common sense at the door when we start to read scripture. In fact, it means the opposite. Our faith calls on us to fully engage our minds as we study the word of God. We must be diligent learners. Understanding the Bible is difficult. You could have been a Christian for decades, attended Bible college, got a PhD in theology, and still have thousands of unanswered questions. From a personal perspective, I find the more I do discover, the more there is to learn. But then everything in life that is of real value is hard to accomplish. 
There are no spiritual shortcuts. It takes hard work and determination. It will take a whole life to only fully understand a portion of the Bible because it is a living document. It is the way that God continues to speak to us today. It is God breathed. It is God speaking to us. His Holy Spirit speaks today as it did thousands of years ago. But what about when the Bible directly contradicts itself? Let's have a look at Proverbs 26 verses 4 to 5. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. This appears to be a direct contradiction in scripture, but such contradictions are really paradoxes that point us to a deeper truth. To give an example from secular literature, let's have a look at the opening lines of A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom and it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going directly to heaven. We were all going directly the other way. A passage full of contradictions that describes the duality of the human experience. This quote reminds us that life is often a mixture of contrasting experience. There are moments of great joy <coughs> and prosperity the best of times, as well as moments of hardship and adversity, the worst of times, and often at the same time. The paradox is the same for Proverbs 26. Think about this. You're scrolling through social media and you see something that's really stupid or untrue posted online. The question is, do you engage? And if you do, does that ever go well? But then if you don't engage with the stupidity, what happens to the person who posted it? And the misinformation? They think they must be right because no one has said anything to the contrary. So with this in mind, let us reread Proverbs 26. Do not answer a fool according to his folly or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly or he will be wise in his own eyes. It's true, isn't it? It's a proverb for our age. Or to use another phrase, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Or one that really does make me giggle. If you wrestle a pig, you will be filthy and the pig will enjoy it regardless. Meaning to engage in a struggle with an opponent that benefits from the struggle even without winning it. So often, when we encounter these biblical contradictions, they are meant as a paradox to point us to a deeper truth. Bible scholar Peter Williams, writer of Can We Trust the Gospels, says, The presence of such deliberate formal contradictions does not mean that the contradictory statements are, both true, are, <coughs> are not both true in some way at a deeper level. The Bible is inspired. It is trustworthy. It is reliably true. That doesn't mean that it isn't difficult to understand. And it doesn't mean that we aren't going to struggle at times. But it is a reliable source for how we act for correcting and training in righteousness. This is where we find out what is acceptable in God's eyes and what is right. How to live in right relationship with God and with others. How to conduct our everyday lives and how to work and live through hard times. We learn how to give and forgive. It's full of practical advice and wisdom, how to bring up children and how to care for elderly relatives. So while the Bible is not always literal, it is always morally and spiritually true. Then the question remains whether the Bible is also sometimes literally historically true, or in other words, is it all just a collection of esoteric spiritualisms? 
No, there are parts of the Bible that purport to give us history that we can rely on to be historically true. To answer the question, did it actually happen? Bar Terman, a leading New Testament scholar and author of Misquoting Jesus, lays out two primary criteria that historians, when they are studying the Bible, use to assess the reliability of a text. The earlier the better, and the more the better. Essentially, the more copies of a text that we have that are closer to the event happening, then the more accurate they are going to be. The same is true in a court of law. For example, if I had witnessed a murder 25 years ago and I was the only person there, that's one degree of evidence. But if 10 people say they witnessed a murder yesterday, their evidence is going to provide a much stronger case. Their evidence would have much greater weight. The same is true with biblical text. And so when we apply those same criteria, the earlier the better and the more the better to the text of the New Testament, it reveals that the Bible has the earliest and the largest amount of sources compared to any other text in antiquity. Quoting Bar Ehrman again, this is how he sums it up. The New Testament Gospels are the oldest and the best sources we have for knowing about the life of Jesus. This is the view of all serious historians of antiquity of every kind, from committed evangelical Christians to hardcore atheists. We don't have to believe everything on faith. The Bible actually contains documents that historians are the that historians say are the best we could ask for. But the question still remains is whether they are true, whether the history they report actually happens. If we take the example of Jesus's life, we actually have excellent examples outside of the Bible that corroborate what the Bible says. The Roman historian and senator Tacticus referred to Jesus, his execution by Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius, and the existence of early Christians in Rome in his final work, Annals, written in approximately in AD 116. Also, a first century Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus, writes at length about Jesus and confirms what he said about <coughs> what he said about him in the New Testament, how he lived, what he did, what he taught, his death, and his purported resurrection. Something else that points to a particular text's authenticity is called the criterion of embarrassment. The criterion of embarrassment is a type of historical analysis in which a historical account is deemed to be likely, is deemed likely to be true under the inference that the author would have no reason to invent a historical account which might embarrass them. For example, you see me with a new car and ask me why I got rid of the old one. And I say, I was getting tired of the old one and I prayed and I prayed very hard. And poof, there was a new one on my driveway. Or instead, I say, I foolishly left the handbrake off the old car when I went inside the house to put the shopping away and it rolled down the hill and collided with a tree, writing off the car and leaving me in a legal dispute with the council for the damage to the tree and surrounding fencing. The second one is more believable, not because God couldn't have provided me with a brand new car if he'd wanted to, but because why would I tell a story that made me look like a ditzy blonde? Certain biblical scholars have used this as a metric for assessing whether the New Testament's accounts of Jesus' actions and words are historically probable. The assumption of the criteria of embarrassment is that the early church would hardly have gone out of its way to create or falsify historical material that embarrassed its author or weakened its positions in arguments with opponents. Rather, embarrassing material coming from Jesus would be either suppressed or softened in later stages of the gospel tradition. This criteria is rarely used by itself and is typically a number of criteria, such as the criterion of dissimilarity and the criterion of multiple attestation, along with the historical method. The crucifixion of Jesus is an example of an event that meets the criterion of embarrassment. 
This method of execution was considered the most shameful and degrading in the Roman world. And advocates of the criterion claim this method of execution is therefore the least likely to have been invented by the followers of Jesus. The point is, when we read the Bible, it is full of embarrassing stories that make the fathers and mothers of our faith look rather bad. The Old Testament patriarchs come across as treacherous lying thieves. King David, hero of the Old Testament, is labelled an adulterer, a murderer and shown to be a bad father. If you were to invent history, surely you would have painted these central figures of our faith in a more positive light. These embarrassing tales smack of authenticity, but still, there are real difficulties in the Bible. I don't want to pay power over. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't abandon belief in the inspiration of scripture, because what I found is, the more we struggle with these difficulties, the greater our understanding becomes. I would encourage you to take a view of the Bible, especially over these next few weeks, as inspired by God, as we wrestle together with these difficulties. I've come to appreciate that there are many things that I don't understand about the Bible, but it tells me that my God is bigger than my understanding. To quote Isaiah 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This means I'm coming into communication with a being who is far greater than I am, and that is deeply encouraging to me. The Bible is full of mysteries to be solved, not just contradictions to be dismissed, and some things we will never understand this side of heaven. I encourage you to join a Bible study group, as many of you do in Livingstone. It's an excellent way to dig deep into tough questions, looking into the Word of God, coming under the authority God as we wrestle through the tough questions studying the Bible together. It will help you immensely in understanding what the scriptures teach and how it applies in your life. The thing that has made the greatest difference in my life and helped me the most is start reading the Bible for yourself and digging deep into it. I read the Nicky Gumball Bible in One Year Devotional Study, but there are many others. Start small and don't try to read the Bible in a single sitting and build up until you are reading the scriptures daily and soaking in the word of God. If you really want to discover the answers to some of life's toughest questions, we have a clear place to, place to turn to, and that is the Bible. It is trustworthy. It is inspired by God. It is a useful tool for correction and training in righteousness and that everyone who is a servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good word. That is why we're doing this series. That is why we are asking the tough questions so that we can be equipped and sent out to engage a lost and hurting world that desperately needs words of truth, truth, light and life. May the scriptures teach us, correct us, as uncomfortable as that is, May they train us on how to act righteously so that we may be proficient and equipped for every good work. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I wish you all a blessed week. God bless.